going. I think setting up for Facebook Live. Boom, boom, boom. I think we're just about there. I think we're live. We are, we're, well, we might be live. I think we are live. Hold on a minute. Almost there. Uh, sorry, guys. We are. Here is everybody. All right. Okay. I think we're live. I'm just going to check real quick on everything. We are still have people coming in through Zoom. And it looks like we are live on Facebook. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Chesapeake Bay Foundation webinar, Blue Crabs, Claw and Order. There was a request to do the Law and Order theme song, but I have many talents, but that one is not quite there yet. But stick around, maybe next year when we come back to do our update, I may have mastered it by then. My name is Alice Christman, and I am the manager of marketing and community engagement at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And we are here to talk about my favorite critter, the blue crab, because nothing says summer like a good crab feast. Am I right? Well, I'm excited to learn more about this species and get a little hint about how they might be doing this year. Today, we are joined by education and science experts. First, we'll hear from Ken Slazik. Ken, if you just give a little wave. He is the general manager of our Virginia Field Education Program. Per his bio, he has been at CBF for 19 years, teaching students and teachers how to enjoy being on the bay. And according to him, life was totally irrelevant up until he joined CBF. I know that Ken loves being on the bay with his family and also is a really talented artist. If you haven't had a chance to check out his claymation on crabs. I hope you do. It's a pretty good one. We are also joined by Chris Moore. Chris Moore is the regional, uh, wait, I got to start all over. Chris Moore is the senior regional ecosystem scientist for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. What that means is that he works on policies related to fisheries like oysters, menhaden, and of course, the mighty blue crab. And when he is not sitting in front of a computer, he can be found on the bay exploring with his family and his dog. And last but not certainly not least, my faithful production assistant, Tanner Council. Tanner, if you don't mind waving at the crowd, he will be managing our Q&A later. He might look familiar to you if you attended the oil drilling webinar earlier this week. He was the leader and I played the part of production assistant. Tanner is gonna be managing our Q&A. We are taking questions throughout the program and we'll address them at the end of the program. Don't be shy, he's ready to take your questions. With that being said, we're going to go ahead and we're going to get started with our first speaker today, and that is the man, the myth, the legend, Ken Slazik. Now, Ken, this is not this is not your normal setting for teaching, but I like I like what I'm seeing here. I have yeah, to say, I'm trying to do the best I can, you know. Yeah. But, so, uh, well, hi everybody. Thanks, Alice. Uh, as you can see, I'm in the underwater grasses of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and certainly, you know, these, are, these grasses are important habitat for many different animals, uh, but certainly vital for everybody's favorite blue crab, uh, Calinectus sapidus. Um, you know, with its easily recognizable silhouette, uh, blue crabs are an icon of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, most people's experience, though, is just catching and eating them. Uh, but this animal has a rich and storied life cycle that most people are unaware of. Um, really, every inch of this animal is uh, made for survival. Um, you know, everybody knows that it has a shell, uh, which we call the exoskeleton with its sweeping lines and all its little points for protection. Uh, then we have the claws. Um, and if you've ever messed with a crab and been pinched by, by uh, the claws, you know uh, they can be pretty formidable. Uh, so they use them for defense, but you know, mostly they're using it for food gathering. Uh, they use it to crush or tear food items. Um, crabs are detritivores, which means they're mostly eating uh, decomposed organic material, but really they'll exploit any easy food item, including other crabs, which is uh, you know, a little crazy. Um, they have these six walking legs, which seem kind of uninteresting, but um, something cool about them is they have little hairs on, on, their, on their legs that help them taste things. Um, and then they have these guys right here, these swimmerettes, the paddle-like structures in the back. Um, like I said, their name is Sapidus, which translates to savory, beautiful swim. So, savory, delicious, 
Davis, as we all know who eat them. Uh, and then beautiful swimmer coloration. Uh -oh. And then you'll see them swimming up towards the surface of the shell um, at a structure called the egg. Hmm. Can I think we're having some technical difficulties? Um, wait, um, Ken, can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you see me? I can see you. I can see you. I think I think we just had a little bit of a, a sound issue there for a hot second. So just to review real quick, Calinectus, can you review the name again one more time for me? Calinectus. Yeah, Calinectus, Calinectus, Calinectus sapidus means awesome. savory, beautiful swimmer. Uh, savory is just delicious. Good, good to eat. Okay. Um, and beautiful swing around riding the tides uh, to get it around to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so they also, you can tell a gender of a crab by looking at their apron, uh, which is underneath their shell, uh, which is for a male or a jimmy crab is this long skinny structure right here. Um, underneath the apron is where the reproductive organs of a crab are. So that's a jimmy crab. And then an immature female is going to be this uh, triangle shape. And immature just means that she's not an adult yet, that she can't produce eggs. Um, and then a, ma a female uh, that's mature is going to have this dark blue dome shape. And so we call these immature females sally crabs and these mature females sooks, S-O-O-K. And that just means that she's uh, mated with a male. She could produce eggs. Um, she's near, you know, towards the end of her life. Um, when a female is going from immature to mature, um, is the last time she'll shed her shell. Um, and so it's also the last time that she'll ever, ever mate with a male. So crabs have to shed their shell to get bigger. And they do this about 20 times over the ready to mate is the last time that she'll do that. And so what she does is she emits a pheromone into the water that attracts other, uh, that attracts males um, in the grass beds. And so um, the first male that gets there um, we'll settle down on top of her in his, can you see that? Yeah, I can. It looks great. <laughs> yeah, so he's uh, cradling her in his walking legs and they'll, you know, spend a period of time uh, together doing this. And then they'll go into the grass beds and she'll actually shed her shell for the last time. And he'll assist her to do that. And then while she's a soft crab, they'll, they'll actually mate. He'll insert two sperm packets inside her shell. Uh, and then he continues to protect her uh, until her shell hardens up completely and she can defend herself. And then they part ways. So um, what she'll do is she'll take one of those sperm packets and she'll, um, she'll fertilize a set of eggs right away. And then she starts to migrate towards the mouth of the bay. And so when she's doing that, um, this apron that she had earlier starts folding away and you'll see a sponge of crabs is what we call it, sponge crab. And it'll start out as kind of a yellow, and then it'll turn darker as, she, as she's moving along. You know, this, this migration that she's doing could take 14 days, or, you know, it could be over 100 miles uh, for her to get to the mouth of the bay. And if she even survives that and gets there, um, she'll release the eggs into the Atlantic Ocean, um, and they'll hatch. And their first stage is this beautiful guy right here, right? This is a larval crab. This is called a zoea, and microscopic. You know, part of the plankton world, and uh, they'll go through about seven stages of the zoea, and that takes about 30 to 40 days or so, and they'll um, they'll molt and get a little bigger and a little bigger. microscopic, right? Uh, and then about uh, this megalop, more like a crab that we that we know. It's got the, the claws and the legs, and uh, it's got this little tous in here, this tail uh, that will eventually turn into uh, its apron, right? Um, and so that takes about another um, another thirty days or so for you know a crab uh, to go from a megalops to a, what we call the first crab or juvenile crab, which, which looks more like a crab that we know. Uh, but again, it's only millimeters across, and they're moving back into the Chesapeake Bay, and they're looking for this these grass beds, this this habitat that they need uh, to survive. Um, you know, from this stage, from a zoea, from the first egg hatching to an adult crab, could be two and a half to three years of time. Um, and even though the female is releasing, you know, up to two million eggs at a time, only a, 
about 20% or less are going to survive and make it to this stage. So, you know, everything is against the blue crab. Everything's trying to eat it um, from the moment she's, the crabs are being wiped off their, their, um, the female's body and hatching and to, to an adult crab. Um, I think that's about all my time. I could keep talking about crabs all day. It's so exciting. Um, but I just realized I was talking while I was on mute. Bad, bad zoom, bad zoom. Oh, oh, okay. No, Ken, this is, this is amazing. So what I, what I do when I'm at home alone, I play with. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that this is what I love about this is this is just an example of how our education program works. We work on drawing people in as much as we can by getting them as close to what and being creative about how we teach to make sure people are engaged. And I know that um, things are a lot different right now with how we're teaching, but we have this great learn outside, learn out home program, right? Right, Ken? That's right. Yeah. So we have a lot of talented uh, people in the education department who have worked very hard uh, in coming up with instructional videos, uh, not just for students, but for adults as well. Uh, journal um, uh, entries. Nat nature journaling yeah. and student investigations, and we'll have a little bit more information about that at the end of the program, but this is like a snapshot of the type of education you could be providing for your kids at home between now and the end of the school year. School's not over yet. It's still May. That's right. uh, <laughs> uh, I know we have some great questions coming through, so stick around. Ken, I'm going to, we're going to transit transition to my friend, Chris Moore. Chris, if you don't mind sharing your screen, we're going to switch to the science side. And we're going to get, I know we're going to have some questions for yours. I already know I'm going to have questions for yours. So I'm excited to learn more. Great. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, unfortunately, unlike Ken, I don't get to learn outside every day. And uh, I'm usually inside in meetings and things like that. So uh, you get a PowerPoint um, from me in this case. But I hope there's some good information in here that you learn um, going through this. So Blue crabs, uh, obviously one of the first species, the most iconic species that we think about when we think about the Chesapeake Bay. Um, they're hugely important as a seafood item. Uh, they're really important as a food source to lots of different uh, critters that are out there in the Chesapeake Bay. And they've actually are one of our indicators in the State of the Bay report that the Chesapeake Bay Foundation releases every couple of years because of, of both that iconic nature and, and that really important uh, key that they maintain in the overall food web in the Chesapeake Bay. So before I talk a little bit more about crabs, I first wanted to talk about grasses and Ken touched on, on this item as well. Um, the underwater grasses that we have in the Chesapeake Bay are one of the most important habitats that we actually have for blue crabs in the Chesapeake Bay. And this is actually data from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Uh, each year they go out and fly all over the Chesapeake Bay and the tributaries and measure how many underwater grasses we actually have out there in terms of acreage. And so this is a, a kind of a good news, bad news slide. Uh, the good news is obviously you can generally see that through the efforts of what we call the Chesapeake Bay Blueprint to improve water quality, we're seeing grasses generally go in an upward direction. And, and that's a good thing. Um, you can see though that um, the goal for underwater grasses in the Chesapeake Bay, we're still a pretty good ways under that. Uh, this is just grasses in the main stem of the bay. Um, for the first time two years ago, ago we actually got to 100,000 acres bay system wide. And that was, a, that was kind of a watershed event for us in terms of continuing to restore underwater grasses, seeing improvements in water quality, and making habitats out in the Chesapeake Bay better for not only blue crabs, but a number of different species that we have out on the bay. So another really important habitat, especially as grasses have retreated in the bay, is oyster or is oysters. And this is actually a picture of a oyster restoration project down here in the Southern Bay uh, in the uh, Lafayette River. It's a, uh, basically a tributary to the Elizabeth River. Uh, this is a project that was done in partnership with the Elizabeth River Project funded by NOAA. But these type of projects are not only great for creating other oyster habitat, uh, but they create great blue crab habitat as well. Um, really small crabs, like Ken was talking about when they first migrate back into the Chesapeake Bay, We'll, we'll get on these uh, oyster reefs, they'll forage around, um, find food sources and things like that, like worms that are very common in oyster restoration projects. And it also protects them from larger predators that may want to eat them, like other blue crabs and striped bass, things like that. Uh, believe it or not, one of the biggest predators on blue crabs is other blue crabs. They're actually really cannibalistic, and that's one of the things that, that affects their population in, in any given year. 
So I want to talk a little bit more and, and kind of show you a picture of uh, the migration pattern that Ken talked about a little bit earlier in his presentation. So first, because I think our eyes always go to pictures, uh, that Sally crab or that juvenile female, uh, that's actually the picture there on the top right corner. Um, and so that's a crab that uh, is uh, fully grown or maybe not quite fully grown, but um, she hasn't mated with a male crab at this point. Uh, the second picture there on the bottom right is actually what we call a sponge crab. Uh, some of the watermen refer to them as busted sooks. Um, that's an orange sponge. So that um, sponge has just come out in the last couple of days. As the eggs work to mature, uh, that sponge will actually become darker and darker and it'll get almost jet black at the end. And, and what the reason for that is, is actually the eyes of the, the blue crab larvae actually developing. And uh, once she becomes a black sponge within a, a couple of days, uh, she'll actually release those eggs down near the mouth of Chesapeake Bay. And as Ken kind of talked about earlier, they'll actually head out in the ocean uh, for their first couple of weeks of their life. And uh, they won't look anything like a, a blue crab at that point. Um, sometimes they look more like insects. I think sometimes they look more like lobsters, uh, believe it or not. But um, kind of looking now at the, at the, uh, the map of the bay, they come back in, into the bay, usually late summer, early fall. Um, every once in a while, you'll actually hear about people here, especially in the lower bay, uh, getting uh, bit by sea lice. Some of those sea lice actually are real small blue crab larvae that are migrating uh, back into the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so once they've kind of entered the mouth of the bay, uh, blue crabs will spread out all over, um, heading up towards Maryland um, for some portion of the population, heading into the western shore tribs like the James, the Rappahannock, the York. And um, they'll basically spend about their first, first year there. Uh, at that point, the females will start to mate with those males and they'll start to migrate back down to the, to the lower end of the Chesapeake Bay where they'll eventually release those eggs, those larvae, and that'll start the process over. Uh, one of the interesting things about blue crabs is they're fairly short lived. They only, the average age of a blue crab in Chesapeake Bay is only about 1.6 years old. So. Uh, they've got to do a lot of things in that fairly short lifetime in order to make sure the population is healthy. So one of the things that I really wanted to talk a little bit about is how do we know what the population of blue crabs looks like in Chesapeake Bay? Is it, is it stable? Is it healthy? Is it growing? Is it contracting? Things like that. And so luckily, when it comes to the blue crab population in Chesapeake Bay, we have a really, really good survey called the Winter Dredge Survey. That's basically a population survey that's done between December and March of every year in the Chesapeake Bay. It's a partnership between the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And what they do is they actually go out to about 1500 sites out in Chesapeake Bay and in its tributaries and they pull this big crab dredge you see here on the right for one minute um, at these different locations. Once they do that, they, they pull the dredge up after they pulled it for a minute and they count the number of crabs they are, that they're in the, in the dredge, they count how big they are, if they're males or females, and what other critters they actually find when they're out there doing this. Once they're, they're done with all that field work, they take this information back to some uh, pretty powerful mathematical models, and it gives us an annual estimate of what the blue crab population looks like uh, in any given year. And so the data that we get to get from that actual survey looks kind of like this. And uh, fortunately, we'll actually see the results of this past year's data here in the next couple of weeks. So be looking out for new stories about that. But going back to 2019, you can see that it was actually a pretty good year in terms of the overall population of blue crabs. And so what you're seeing on this chart, the blue line is the number of crabs that are estimated using the data from the winter dredge survey. That green line is uh, the target population. So that's where we wanna be. We don't have to be at it or above it in any given year. We just, we just want to kind of bounce around it. Um, that's what it amounts, amounts to. And the red line in the fisheries management world is what we call a threshold. And that's really the line we don't want to go below in order to make sure we have a, a stable population. So a couple things that kind of jump out on this chart. One, you can see that that period from about 1995 to about 2008 was a period where we had very stable but low abundance, unfortunately. And that's not a situation we want to be in. Um, in addition, you can see that we didn't have real high highs or lows as a part of that. And that's an indication that the population was stressed and, and beginning to shrink a bit. You can see uh, in 2008, 
Virginia and Maryland uh, got together and instituted a, a, a really wide ranging, more conservative management plan for blue crabs. And you can see generally that it has borne fruit uh, since that time. And we did have another time down at the threshold again, but generally since 2008, our numbers have been a lot better. Um, an, an, another component of this chart is you can see that this highlights the adult female blue crab abundance. That's the key indicator that we use to determine if the blue crab population is healthy or not. Um, that shows us that we have enough blue crabs, remember they, they don't live for a long time, but to spawn or basically to produce new generations of blue, cra of blue crabs during the next year. And so this is really the key indicator of what we look at when we're trying to gauge the health of the blue crab population overall. Uh, another thing we look at is, is commercial harvest. And again, we'd have a similar chart. It would be reversed where the, the, gr the green line would be below the red line. But our commercial harvest the last couple of years has, has remained uh, right about where we want to see it in terms of making sure we have a healthy population uh, moving forward. In fact, it's really been below even the number that we consider healthy for about the last seven or eight years. So what are some of the things that CBF uh, prioritizes when it comes to blue crab management? One, we wanna make sure that we make changes as that population changes. Uh, we want to respond to different changes in the population in any given year with changes in the regulations. And so that's why, you, that's why you might hear about the seasons uh, being longer or shorter in any given year, or the number of pots that, that uh, commercial watermen may be able to fish in any given year. We Doing that makes sure that we don't harvest too many in the years that um, the population is down a bit, but it also ensures that our commercial watermen can catch more crabs in the years when the population is higher. Uh, the next part is what we call habitats improvements through the Chesapeake Bay Blueprint. And this is what CBF has been working on for years now. The Chesapeake Bay Blueprint, which guides our water quality improvements in Chesapeake Bay. That's what's going to, one, help bring back those underwater grasses that Ken talked about that are so important to the population. Uh, it's also going to help with our oyster restoration efforts as well. We're not going to have as many dead zones and we're not going to have as many uh, detrimental water quality events that are going to stress our natural habitats that are so important to the blue crab population in Chesapeake Bay. So this time of year is kind of an exciting time of year for the for blue crabs in Chesapeake Bay. Our crab season has just started. Um, in Virginia, it started in mid-March. In Maryland, it started in April 1st. Uh, so right now, watermen are actually out catching crabs. Uh, in the bay and uh, are ready for, for you to consume and, and enjoy. Uh, the most common way that we catch blue crabs in the Chesapeake Bay is through using pots like this. Um, these are hard, what we call hard crab pots and uh, they're used in the main stem of the bay up in Maryland and throughout the waterways in Virginia. Uh, in Maryland, in the tributaries, there's what's called a trot line fishery and that's where watermen catch crabs on individual pieces of bait and, and net them or dip them as they come up into the boat. Um, we also have a scrape fishery that operates primarily in the, the mid portion of Chesapeake Bay. Um, it's, a, it's back breaking work. The, the watermen are kind of bent over all day, but they're actually scraping kind of the top of the grass beds in order to catch some of those females and some hard crabs as well um, that, that, are, that are there in those grass beds. Um, those, those females, especially there that are molting, those are the crabs that fuel what we call our soft shell. A market for blue crabs. And those crabs uh, fetch a very high value, high dollar per crab for watermen. And uh, it really increases per crab the amount, of, the amount of money that they get for their crabs. Uh, here in Virginia, we also, in, in Maryland a little bit too, we also use a slightly different pot from this um, to catch peelers as well. And they also go into our, our, our soft shell fishery as well. Uh, so right now, as you may have heard, uh, a lot of seafood, a lot of the seafood industry is facing um, a, a lot of downturn because of, of COVID-19. And one of the things that you can do is our, our watermen are still out there harvesting seafood, our aquaculturists are still out there growing oysters and clams and things like that. And so now is a great time to develop a relationship with your local watermen or with uh, your local seafood purveyor and still be able to enjoy the bounty of the bay um, this time as well. And it'll help those industries that are suffering a lot at this point. And now is a great time to, to be eating crabs because generally the population is healthy and it's something we can definitely enjoy. Awesome. Get Keep this plan in place, right, Chris? That's right. <laughs> so we're going to transition to the Q&A and we have quite a few questions coming through. And Tanner, I'm going to let you just take it from here. We're going to go lightning round style. I'm going to get my... 
I think so. We've got a lot of questions here. So I think what we'll do to try to get through them in a short amount of time is I'm going to throw a few at Ken and I'll throw a few at Chris because I think you all can probably answer um, a lot of these very quickly. So I'll start with Ken. Um, do baby crabs or larvae have just one eye or multiple eyes? Ken, we need to, you need to unmute your audio, Ken. So you are muted. There you go. Very better. <laughs> yes, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. So even though this guy looks like he has one eye, he has two. There's two eyes. One okay. On that was, yep. Ken, why are crabs blue? Uh, wow. Uh, you know, I, I really don't know. Um, why is the grass green? Yeah, right. right. I'm, not, I'm not really sure on that. I, I would add to that, though, you know, maybe it, not so much the blue piece, but, but blue crabs uh, exhibit what we call counter shading, uh, which a lot of our species in Chesapeake Bay do. And so what that basically means, obviously, is if you're uh, something that wants to eat a blue crab and you look down on it, you know, it has that dark uh, top shell to it, which kind of hides it in the bay's bottom. And then if crabs, which are blue crabs or swimming crabs, if they're swimming through the top of the water, they look very light uh, from, from underneath them. And so that helps with predators not basically swimming up and eat them from below. So a lot of our different species exhibit that counter shading in Chesapeake Bay. I'll throw one back to Ken too. Which, do you happen to know which life cycle stage do stripers or rockfish like to eat the most? Uh... Um, well, certainly the bigger crabs, um, I, I don't know for sure, but, you know, I, if you've ever been fishing for stripers, sometimes you, you know, you coat open the belly and you might find a few juvenile crabs in there, um, but I don't know if they prefer one or the other. Okay. Um, Chris, I'll go to you for a couple of these. Is commercial fishing limited to males or is there more a quota or more of a quota for females? So it's, it's not limited to males or females. Uh, a lot of what happens with the blue crab fishery depends on where it takes place in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, because of that migration pattern that Ken and I talked about with most of the females coming back down in Virginia, the Maryland fishery tends to be about 70% um, males to about 30% females. And obviously that changes in, in different years. Whereas the Virginia fishery tends to be about the opposite because our population is different. Um, there are limits on the number of crabs you can take during diff different times of the year, and that hopefully balances the impact of catching males and females throughout the, the watershed. Um, I've got a, another one for you, Chris. Does anything else besides crabs get stuck in, in crab traps? Uh, yes, lots of different things can get stuck in crab traps, and especially if you're putting crab traps in areas where it's really marshy. Um, and this is no matter in the mid bay or the lower bay or the upper bay. Uh, one of the things that unfortunately loves to get into crab traps the most are diamondback terrapins. And uh, unfortunately, as you can imagine, once they get in, they can't escape and then get out to breathe because they've got to get up and breathe air. So one of the best things you can do if you're pushing crab pots out in the waterways near tidal marshes and things like that is to install what are called uh, turtle excluder devices. They're orange. Uh, they're little rectangular devices. They go right into the funnel of your crab pot, and that'll make sure that all your crabs can still get in, but it'll keep uh, your diamondback terrapins from getting in your pot as well. Thank you. Uh, Ken, back to you. Um, you indicated that the average life of or lifespan of a blue crab is 1.6 years. Do you know how old they could get without um, outside, of, outside effects? Or what's the oldest blue crab you think you've, you've found? Ken? Oh, is that uh, to me? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, hi. Hi, Ken. Uh, we, want, we want to know the oldest blue crab you found. Yeah, you're kind of cutting out. Um, oh, sorry. You know, it's 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 hard to to date uh, crabs. Uh, you know, uh, they grow depending on uh, availability of food and uh, temperature of the water, and you know, when they shed their how many times they shed their shells. Uh, so oh. it's really kind of hard to. Sorry. Uh, huh? Sorry. Nope. I'm having some slight issues. Go on, Ken. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it's so it's really kind of hard to to age them. Um, I'll tell you, like the biggest crab I've ever caught was um, was about seven inches across um, from point to point. Um, so like if you go from 
from this point to that point. Um, so I don't know how old that was, but um, I've heard of crabs being bigger than that, nine and 10 inches as well. So awesome. Alice, do I have time for one more or should we I move? think we're going to wrap this up. All of that sure. questions that we didn't have a chance to get to, we will. We have recorded them. I will get back to you. I promise. Um, I am going to wrap up with a few fun announcements. Some of you have already probably seen these slides. We're learning as we go on along with this Zoom thing. Six weeks ago, I didn't even know what Zoom was. Now I'm like live on Facebook. Uh, learn outside, learn at home. Why do all the teaching when we've got some great, um, great tools for you? Please go to cbf.org and go to the learn outside, learn at home page. We've got student investigations, nature journaling. You can ask an expert videos. We have a lot of really cool videos similar to what Ken did. You can look at Ken claymation video about crabs it's awesome he did all of the art he's outrageously talented and this is not just for kids we actually have some CF cbf staff members whose parents have done these investigations so they are adult approved um today begins a fun campaign called block the watershed from now to the end of june you can walk the we are asking people to create with teams and individuals to walk 200 miles to support Chesapeake Bay clean water. Go to cbf.org backslash walk the watershed. And finally, you can always go to cbf.org backslash give to support us and follow us on our social channels. Mm -hmm. And finally, coming up next week, we're going to talk about birds. This amazing picture was taken by Bill Portlock, who is an incredible birder. He's my favorite favorite bird photographer. We're excited to have him on staff and doing our webinar next week. And we're going to hear from Chris Moore in June as we get another fisheries update. And we've got microplastics coming up at the end of May. If you have questions, please contact Ken Slazik or Chris Moore. This is their contact information. And I'd like to also thank my production assistant, Tanner Cancel, all of our audiences on Zoom and Facebook. And I'd like to leave you all with this moment of Bay Zen. This is, this is what we, why we do what we do in the education department, getting kids engaged outside and loving the Chesapeake Bay. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great day.